I'm Peter Silva, and I am literally thrilled to have the former lead singer of Little Texas and three-time Grammy nominee with me today, Tim Rushlow. Tim, what an honor. Nice to see you. What's happening, Peter? How are you, man? Doing good? Doing real good now that we've connected. Well, yeah, man. I think you're officially hired as my new PR guy. That was quite a good intro. So, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Way to a go. little practice goes a long way. You know that. Absolutely, man. <laughs> And you worked for F5 for quite a while, I understand. Little over, coming up in June, will be 17 years. So I have a lot of these shirts laying around. I love it. Hey, can you spare one of those? I need some clean clothes. Absolutely. Once this uh, whole thing is done, I'm more than happy to send you a, a little uh, care pack of F5 bag. Absolutely. Some, some F5, that's it, awesome. More than happy to. It'd be great. So now you're a musician. And F5 is a technology company. And when you recorded your first album with Little Texas back there in the early 90s, it was primarily an analog and tape recording process. And now it's really transformed into a digital recording process. And I'm curious, like, how has it changed for you as an artist and a musician as the technology has changed over the years? Has it been better? Not so good. I don't know. Great question. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a kind of a twofold answer. I think overall that um, my job description as a conveyor of songs, lyrics, melodies, you know, front man live when I'm playing a concert to try to make you forget about your problems for an hour, which is kind of what I'm born to do. You know, um, that part probably hasn't really changed much because it's still the core of, of who I am. Yep. However, on the taking it and transforming it into making a product for people to hear on the radio or at today on Sirius XM or, or whatever, it's different. You know, it's not like just your local stations anymore. Everything's changed. Everything's become digital. But in the recording world, it, it, it was an interesting time when Little Texas first started that we literally would, they would be like, okay, we're rolling. And you would, you would literally see the big two-inch tape recorder rolling tape and we would record a song and we would rewind it. And then we'd be like, hey, you know, we could use some maracas on that. Or Tim could have sang a better vocal. Let's go and redo that. And you, and you do it like that. And you build that track to become what is known as a famous song on the radio. Yeah. So that, that romance for me of that is always there. Because it reminds me of Elvis and Buddy Holly and all those greats from the 50s forward. That, and think about this. From the 40s all the way until the mid-90s, 50 plus years, it was done one way, all analog, right? So when we went digital, it had its glitches for a while where people would say, oh, it doesn't sound as warm. It doesn't sound as, as inviting to me. It sounds kind of uh, kind of brassy, you know? So, and they're not wrong, it did. <clears throat> so for me, I think the two differences are that the music's not changed. What's changed is the presentation of it. But I think that the digital world's gotten amazing at mimicking the analog world now. And I think they've got a fine medium in there where it does really well. So I'm quite right. Quite and even that. back and back then, right, when when you would redo a take, you you would all play together again as a band versus oh, somebody going to their room and, and recording the strings and somebody going to their room and recording the drums, right? Absolutely. And and and, and in the little Texas too, you know, we we wrote and sang and, and played and produced and kind of did everything ourselves. You know, sort of like we, we didn't have a bunch of studio players doing it for us. We did it ourselves. And, you know, even pre-recording when we were playing clubs and it was, there was no internet, you know, we were just, we would play Monday through Saturday, um, six one hour sets, sometimes five if we were lucky, a night. And we would still practice four hours during the daytime when they were closed. So we were on stage nine hours a day, every day. And then on Sunday, we would pack it up in a van and a trailer. We would drive a thousand miles. We would set up and do it again at another club Monday through Saturday. And so that's how you built your fan base. And that's also how we would test drive our new songs is in front of an audience. There's nothing better than an audience. It's like, I think you know this is, because I know you're a music guy. It's so great when you buy a product and you love it. You're like, oh my gosh, I love this song. And then you hear the other songs on the project and you're like, Ugh. this is like a filler. You know, it's like, this stinks. 
So for, for me personally, but also my days for a little Texas forward, it was always about creating an hour of body of work that you didn't want to hit seek. You didn't want to hit the next song. You wanted to hear the whole thing because it was a body of work. You thought, you know what? That's trusted. And for me, it's always come from playing my songs for audiences live before I've recorded them so that I could get a knee jerk reaction. There's songs I thought would be great. And I had crowds give me the golf clap and I'm like, Okay, I'm not going to record that. They're not doing it, you know. But then there was ones where you'd see them wiping a tear back on the first listen, and you go, okay, that mattered. So, you know, it's kind of, that's how I've always gauged it. So do you miss those days? Like, you know, the kind of hustle, bustle, and and that kind of stuff? You know, I mean, you're established now where you kind of don't have to maybe work as hard. I don't know. Oh, gosh, you know, that's a, that's a trick question, too. No, I always work hard. I'll never <laughs> Hard. I got one speed and I got one drive and I just throttle down, you know, yeah. but, but um, I mean, there are days, I guess I could say I miss, uh, you know, playing live or headed down the highway. I mean, obviously the last year and a quarter has been whacked out with, you know, with other things and COVID and different things that are happening. But at the same time, I, I kind of feel like um, nothing's really changed for me in the creative process. Okay. I'm still Tim Rushlow, whether I'm fronting little Texas or I'm fronting my big band or I'm, just with my guitar, like I would do for you guys, and just play some songs from the tap. Um, I, I love what I get to do. So that hasn't really changed much for me. It, it's, I always, it's really weird. I, I feel like I got this little chip in the back of my brain that always reminds me, every time I pick my guitar up to sing a song, hey Tim, this is special. This is special that you get to do this, bro. So a lot of the whole COVID thing, people are like, man, I bet, I bet you, you, you miss the audiences. And yeah, but you could say that's true. But what I really miss is more for me because it's therapy. It's my therapy too, you know, to, to play those songs for somebody and take them back to that spot they were in this year or whatever. And, and, and watch that magic happen where there's this transaction between me singing for them and then going, oh, I didn't know he wrote that. I didn't know he sang that. Oh my God, I love this song. Or even if they don't know one song I sing, but at the end of the night, they're still going, I didn't know that guy, but he was good and he was honest. I like that. You know, well, way, way problem solved, you know, but that's the part I miss is that that transaction of interaction with an audience where we get to be together in music, you know. Right. But as an artist, too. Right. I mean, it's it's not as if like even if you don't have a show or you're not in the recording studio writing music, you're still picking up the guitar every day and strumming that thing because there's a connection between you and the instrument, whether it's the car, the guitar, oh, yeah. your voice. And that. Totally, you're totally right. And that's something that um, as I've gotten older, <clears throat> I used to kind of take it for granted, but as I've gotten older, I try to sing every day. Um, I try to write every day. If I don't, I at least document ideas. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going to put that on the percolator and just sit on that one for a while, let it marinate, but I'm coming back to that idea. And, and then there's sometimes I'll be at, you know, uh, Kroger, you know, picking up some chicken to grill on the grill for dinner for the kids tonight. And somebody will play something in the grocery line. And I'm like, oh, that was that's good. a song. That's a song yeah. right there. <laughs> and so to me as a creative, it's just, it's just a fun job to be able to convey what everybody's thinking and maybe not even wanting to say, but to say it, you know, so to me, that that's part of the beauty of it. Um, and again, I used to always think maybe it was just for them. And it was for me. It's kind of like when I used to go play for the troops overseas, people were like, oh, I bet you're really happy to bring them a slice of home. And it's like, yeah, in theory, that sounds right until you go there and do it. And then you realize that they brought you the home. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like, wow, you know, I, I felt better. You know, I, I had 3,000 sailors singing God Bless Texas at the top of their lungs to me in the middle of Afghanistan. I wonder who would have thought that. That's really you know? cool. So, yeah, so yeah. Maybe, it, maybe it's not, you know, working less hard. Maybe it's more like um, sort of like you're more selective about the things you want to work on. Maybe that maybe might be a better way of putting it. Totally agree with that. And I also think, you know, as I get older and, and, and just, I think more, maybe more well-rounded as a, as, a, as a dude in the world, that there's things I just want to say. You know, there's things I want to remind people how special this life we have is, yeah. how fragile it is, but how special it is. And not just right now when things are tough, but all the time. You know, when we come out of this, and we will, um, it's going to be amazing. There's going to be concerts and, and record sales and things like people have never seen before because 
people want that back. And music is such a part of the fabric of what we do. And uh, I mean, it, even right now, I, I turned the radio on yesterday and I heard a song I'd never heard before. And the minute I got my phone out and I shazammed it, and I couldn't wait to see who it was. And I found this guy and I was like, oh my gosh. And I clicked on it and I listened to like 18 of his songs and it motivated me. I'm like, I can't believe I don't know this guy. This is great. So yeah, I'm a consumer as well, you know? And so I just know the power of it. And I love to be a part of that fabric. And, um, and I'm never gonna lie and say, that, I'll be honest, it is still a real joy when somebody doesn't know who I am at all. And then they see me sing, you know, 10, 15 songs or five songs and they remember one and go, I didn't know that was him. I love to be the guy to connect those dots. You know, that's a real thrill for me. A lot of guys will be like, well, doesn't that hurt your ego? They don't know who you are. And I'm like, no, I love it when they don't know, but somehow in the midst of the show, they learn. And then they're like, I like this guy. Hopefully they think I'm a nice guy on top of that. Yeah. You, <laughs> you know, you know, and speaking of little Texas, you guys pretty much disbanded, broke up, broke up. That's a great way to ask an interview question. <laughs> broke up. Um, kind of at the height of your career, you had just released like a greatest hits album. And yeah. you know, what, if I remember correctly, it was something like your, um, the record company sort of closed the Nashville office, but what I found, uh, and you decided to take a sabbatical after this, one of the things you wrote, like you didn't, you didn't panic. You didn't sort of try to create another band or, you know, do something what you said. And I'll quote you, I believe that any good, real, and positive, anything good, real, and positive happens organically. So I, I tried to let my writing evolve on its own naturally. And if I remember also something you had mentioned is that when you were, when you were part of the band, you didn't get to write as much until the band broke up. Is that correct? Yeah, it's very true. Um, and thanks for quoting me. That was actually a really good quote. Yeah. You're good. You're good. Um, you know, yeah. Um, in my days with Little Texas, I was primarily the front man, the lead vocalist, the singer. You know, I was doing the interviews. I was doing a lot of other stuff. So my, my, my eyes weren't always focused on the writing. I was the conveyor of it. And quite frankly, the guys were writing great songs. And I gave them full cred. They were doing a great job with that. And so they had that base covered for me. So I could do more of the business stuff. You know, and, and so and, and although it was a great thing when it did come time for it to end and I took a step back for my sabbatical, as you mentioned, I knew I couldn't rush anything. I knew I had some things I wanted to say. Um, and I also knew I didn't I didn't want, I wanted to make a way for my pistons to fit its own engine, not the engine that had been little Texas. You know, I wanted to be able to on my own, have my own either my own Ferrari or my own VW Bug. I wasn't sure which one. But I, I wanted my own car, my own vehicle to be able to say things, do things and sing things. And, and it turned out great. And, um, you know, I had some hits as Tim Rushlow. Um, and that's a hard that's pretty hard to do, because once you've been in a group that's been that successful and then you come out on your own, most of the time it doesn't work. The, the, yeah. the mother has gone, you know, but for me, it did work. And and it's one of those things I think that has a lot to do with just relationships. You know, I, I don't uh, I really value people. I don't, I don't take anything for granted. And so having good relationships with friends in the record business and the radio business and, and, and knowing that they really know my heart of hearts is that I just want to be a good guy. I don't have an angle to play or anything else. And so that really served me well. And to this day, it continues to serve me well. You know, I mean, now that I'm 22, you know, it's really done a pretty <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm just, sorry. Yeah. I, I couldn't well, face. I believe me, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm 54, man. I'm a 66 baby, you know, and, um, ditto. Yeah, well, see, see there, we got, we got it going on. That's the, um, that's the thing I think that's most important for me to take away is that I want to write and record and perform songs from a place that's real, that's authentic and that matters. And, and, and even if someone doesn't know me can at least hear it and go and that guy, he means that. You know, that's cool. And, and if I get that out of somebody, mission accomplished, you know? So in some ways it was, it was liberating in a way to kind of shed that, shed one success to then realize a new success. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, I, and I've always tried to turn things and continue to morph towards a future and not just lean on my past. You know, I don't want to be known as little Tex. Yeah. 
You know, that, I mean, that's, uh, I'm glad I was the vocalist for Little Texas, but that's not all I have in the bag, you know? And so like with my, you know, alter ego that likes to do, you know, the, my, my parents are both crooners and I grew up, you know, listening to the Great America Songbook. And so to be able to do some Bobby Darren stuff with a big band, it's a big deal. I love doing that. And so those things, I don't dive into that sort of kind of do it. I mean, I go all in. And so there's a lot of brands that I've been able to kind of build along the way that I've had fun with. And, uh, and I love doing it. I love Christmas music. I love doing Christmas stuff every year with the big band. Um, so there's all kinds of different things, you know, but all of them are one thing and that's to be creative and to be authentic, you know? So to dive into the past, even though you don't want to, with one more question, sure. I'm sort of curious, like, in the music industry, the whole way of music distribution has completely changed since, wow. you know, back in the day with the A&R guys and, you know, hitting radio stations with records. And oh, by the way, but, you know, that whole analog to digital, there's this whole movement, people loving vinyl again, but I yeah. digress. So, um, you know, now it's like, you know, streaming and Spotify and all of these other kinds of platforms like, do you think a band like Little Texas, because I've heard other artists say this, you know, can, um, you know, ones that were popular 70s, 80s, 90s say, I don't I don't know if our band could be, you know, as successful as it was back in the, you know, the record and radio days versus the, yeah. you know, the streaming online days. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the way I kind of look at that, I'd like to think that we were an entity and a force that was pretty solid and that we, we would have found our way and even in this culture to have made an impact and make it happen. Um, but I don't know because, you know, we, now it's as easy as, you know, Hey, let's make a video and throw it on YouTube and see if we can go viral. Right. You know, back then we were, we were trying to, our whole goal was let's make people stop dancing and stop drinking beer and watch us and go, Whoa, that's great. That was our goal then, and we did it. So I don't know if we could do that today or not in, in the world of viral videos or not. I think we could make some great uh, pieces of work and maybe some great songs and some visual things that would look and sound good, but would it do what we did? I don't know, man. Yeah, yeah. I just, well, you, yeah. And you even mentioned, as my thing gets stuck on my chair, you even mentioned just the whole, um, you know, hitting the road and hitting clubs was how you built an audience where today, yeah. like you mentioned, it's just, Throw it on YouTube and hope to go viral. Hope to go viral. I mean, it's a great. Yeah, I mean, my daughter Bailey, she's an artist and she does Spotify and YouTube and, and she's all over. She has no record deal. She's making a great living and now she's got you know eight, ten million people following her and she's doing great with it. And she didn't have to go play one smoky bar to do that, you know. So, <laughs> so although I'm happy for her, I'm kind of like, man, you know, we I, I worked triple hard back in the day for that, but. It has changed. And so I think today, um, I don't know, man, I, I, I keep coming back to the same thing. And that is that I think authenticity wins, right. you know, um, I, you know what I've been lately, I've become a big fan of like finding people doing cover songs, their version of it. Just, and, and like hearing somebody like, like I will use Bailey, my daughter, like she did, uh, um, she just did a, a Shania Twain song and just her and ukulele. And, uh, and it just went viral because it was just so vastly different than this real produced Shania Twain version. So I like finding things that sound different, you know, and, and I think that's cool. I found a, uh, there's a group called the REO brothers that I found that are on YouTube that are from Thailand and they're five brothers and they do Beatles covers and they're crazy good. They're so good at scary. So I find myself every other, every other day, I zoom in and check out what they're up to. And who would have ever thought some unsigned band doing cover songs from Thailand, that I would love that. Truth is, I do. So I, I, I embrace the culture we have today, and I, I celebrate it, and I enjoy it, but I still go back to my days when I started, and I do miss some of the get your hands dirty, you know? Yeah, yeah. and I guess maybe that's what technology has, has offered, is just some of these artists that might not have otherwise been seen or heard or recognized now have an outlet to share their creativity yeah. and then, you know, then there's opportunities for, you know, yourself, producers, whatever, like, Oh my God, I never even heard of this person. I got to meet them. Yeah. Well, y'all you know, heard a funny story. Um, Levels it, the playing field a little bit. It, it does. I heard a story. It's been about, I don't know, it was probably seven or eight years ago, but 
but I knew that at the time that um, Jonathan Kane and Neil Sean from Journey were really looking for somebody to, you know, that could do the Steve Perry thing. And quite frankly, that's not an easy voice you try to replicate. There's only one Steve Perry, in my opinion. But when they found Arnell from the Philippines right. and they, they saw him on YouTube and they literally saw a video of him singing karaoke doing Journey and they picked the phone up and through hell and high water, they found their way to this kid with, hey, come to the United States. We want you to sit in and to sing with us. And we're Journey. We thought you might like it. <laughs> what, what, are the, what are the odds of that, right? But, but what happened? So eight years later, you know, maybe 10 years, I don't know, they're, they're touring the world and, and he's done a phenomenal job helping them carry that torch and be able to sing those vocals that are very, very hard to sing. And, and so that's a great point of, of the internet and of today's culture and how we're all just striving and seeking and looking for what's authentic, you know? And even Steve Perry himself is very supportive of, of yeah. the band and the singing and like, Hey, dude's great. Like not, none of that sort of, Oh no, this is all mine stuff. It's right. Holy cow. And you know, the humility and, and those kinds of things come in, you know, with performers such as yourself and, sure. and names where he's like, I love it. He's fantastic. I get it. But I think we've kind of covered the whole spectrum there on that, but that where culture's gone with music, I think is fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I love to still break it down to just me and my guitar or me and the piano and to sing songs and tell stories about them. And that's still a big piece of me. So I dig doing it, you know, Hey, I think that's why I'm here today. Maybe. Some yeah. Song. So maybe you, the, you know, one man, one guitar, one night. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about how that kind of came to be? And Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I love, I love being in a band. I love being a musician. I love playing several instruments. Um, and I do all that, but there is something, um, unique about breaking it down to just me and a guitar and telling stories behind the songs and sharing my heart about it. And, 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 and quite frankly, it's pretty vulnerable. You, you're pretty much on the ledge. Cause I mean, if this doesn't work, there's nobody to blame but yourself. You know, it's all on you, man. Okay. So I've learned to be able to go out and, you know, and play performing arts centers or to do corporate events like here or whatever, where you, you get a chance to, to talk a little bit more and to, and to draw people in to understanding what it is you're singing and why you're singing it. You know, and I think that it's, it's, it's been challenging, but to me, it's probably the most rewarding thing I've ever done because I'm not having to use other people on the stage. It's just me. So there's this real intimate feeling where I feel like I'm getting to put people on my couch in my living room and even if I'm playing for, you know, 1,200 people at a performing arts center in Cerritos, California, right, at the Yamaha room, which I love that room there. I'm playing there, and there's 1,200 people. Well, for that one hour and a half, I want them to be in my couch. I want them to feel like they just had a glass of wine, lit a candle, and we're just hanging out and talking. So if you can accomplish that, be about, you know, being authentic and being real, then it's a win-win. And most people i found after that show – come up and go, dude, I love the band, or hey, I love your high energy stuff with the big band, or hey, I love this. But this was great because I really feel like I got to know you. And so as vulnerable and scary as it has been on one end of it, I had to sort of step up as a musician, as a storyteller, as a singer, and it's all on me you know, to pull it off. And so I mean, I've enjoyed doing it very much. It's a lot of fun. So one of the songs I was curious about, She Misses Him. And I was wondering if that is you know, from a personal experience, whether it's a family member or, or just something, you know, like you were mentioning before, like you passed somebody in the supermarket and got a great idea. Cause. Yeah. You know, um, I was recording my solo album on Atlantic records <clears throat> and um, we had room for a couple songs on the album that weren't, we didn't have them yet. And uh, a really good friend of mine had come to me and said, Hey, I got a song for you to listen to. I said, sure. So I listened to Tim's song and, and um, I, I was just uh, moved. And I was like, whoa, no one's ever sang about Alzheimer's before. No one's ever sang about something as, as, uh, as raw as somebody is still physically here, but you miss them. Um, and it just touched me. So we recorded it, we put it out as a single. Um, it was a big hit. And then after, after it was a hit, um, I was approached by the Alzheimer's Association to be one of their national spokesmen for a couple of years, which I did. Um, went to DC to Congress to help raise money 
for Alzheimer's awareness and dementia awareness. And it was one of those really cool opportunities where you realize that music's much bigger than me. And it's much bigger than a, than a situation or an award. It, it um, that's, a, I mean, we're all going to, in our lifetime, we're all going to deal with diseases with friends and family. It's a fact, you know, it's just a part of life, but to raise awareness that, you know, Hey, look, love them while you got them because you know, Alzheimer's can be a very long goodbye. And, and it was ironically um, several times in my life since she misses him has been out. I have been with family members and walked with them through that. And, and it's a, it's a hard thing. It's beautiful, but it's hard. Um, and I remember going to, um, to the nursing homes and singing songs for them just because I wanted to see what I could do to help them connect in some way. Cause some of them are just lost or lonely and it's a hard place to be. you got to put your big boy pants on for that and, and kind of crank up that I'm not going to cry over this because if you don't, you will. Yeah. Um, it's touching, but that was the fun part about that song was being able to walk in to, you know, 50 people that are 95 years old and sing blue moon from the fifties and half these people haven't spoken about a month. And they knew every word to blue moon because it's from a different place in their brain. And it just, the, the paradigm shift kicked in. All of a sudden they're all singing it and they're smiling at me and I'm going, wow, this is why I do what I do. And you know, I didn't write blue moon. It didn't matter. I knew that I could sing it for them and that some of them would remember that, you know? And so she misses him brought out, uh, a, a new place for me to experience life in a new way. And I'm very thankful for that song as well as, you know, many others that I've had, but that one was, uh, is very special. And I still, when I sing it every single night, I sing it, there's always at least five to six people that will come up and they just want to share their story on that song, whether it was their dad or their mom or their grandpa or their aunt, aunt uncle, brother, sister. And, and that's when, you know, you know what, this is why I do what I do. This is why. Therapy with music. Yeah, my mom has Alzheimer's <clears throat> and we try to we try to, you know, call her every week at a certain time, you yeah. know, not bring up things that'll get her distressed because that'll, you know, kind of lead her astray and sort of stick to the the um what's the word I'm looking for? Not common things, but the recognizable yeah. routine, you know, those those kinds of things. So yeah, that one definitely um hit me a, a, a certain way too. So thanks. Sure. Like, like a genuine thanks. Not, yeah, I was crying too. I'll just say it, but <laughs> you know what I mean? It was yeah. just, you know, it's one of those things where like, holy cow, that really, that really hit the mark. I appreciate that. I think as we get older, you know, um, and, and we just live life, we, and especially in the, in the, the day and age, and now we've all been through so much as a, as a world, you know, this isn't some stateside thing or some, you know, thing in Mexico or in Europe, it's everywhere, right? So what we've all experienced as a human mankind race is we've had to learn um, that, you know, hey, things are special. We need to take advantage of those opportunities while we got it, you know? Um, I mean, it sounds stupid. If I want to go have some carrots and hummus for dinner tonight, that carrot's going to taste great. <laughs> you know, it's the little things. It's like, it sounds crazy, but you start to celebrate the little things and all of a sudden the big things are bigger and it, to me, it just, it just makes everything sweeter uh, and it makes music sweeter. You know, that's the one thing through all of this stuff we've talked about and culture and change and, and diseases and all kinds of good and bad music is an unwavering force. Right. It's there, you know, and it brings joy. It brings things to you that make you go, Oh man, I love that. I heard, I saw her standing there in my car earlier today from the Beatles on, on the Beatles channel on XM and I was just like, God, what a great song. I just cranked it up and sang along out like I was 16. And it felt great. You know, and that's what songs do to you. you know? Yeah, it takes you right back to that moment, no matter what time it was. Because, yeah, of course, there's certain songs I hear and instantly it goes back to a certain time, <laughs> certain time that I remember. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah man. There, there's a song by an artist, a, a songwriter. His name is Hugh Prestwood. And he's one of the, he's a prolific songwriter. And he wrote a song for Trisha Yearwood that she recorded years ago. It's one of my favorite songs. That's called A Song Remembers When. And boom, it's just like, it's awesome. Because it, it does, songs remember when. They take you straight to that spot. And I, I love that. It's like, well, if, if there's a song I wish I wrote, it was that one. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to your show. And I'm curious, do you have any pre-show rituals that you've been doing since kind of 
the beginning that have yeah. stuck with you because they're, sure. you know, I, either important or? Yeah, I think for me, it's, um, first off, it's usually a hot shower just to get the steam, you know, get, get my throat kind of ready to rock, which of course, as of late, I've had this little tickle in my throat for a couple of weeks, which has been annoying as can be, but I'm working my way through it. Um, you know, but I think overall, it's just some hot tea. Uh, I try to just be real um, mindful that I'm getting ready to do something special and I don't ever take it for granted. I don't blow it off. I make sure my mind is sort of open and ready for it, you know, and then uh, and I just love to, to again, I, I try to crank up the honest knob and just be as honest as I can be. I'd rather make a big flub and a mistake and laugh about it with an audience than try to cover it up and act like it didn't happen. Yeah. You know, because that, that shows the real side, you know, and that's important. So that's kind of it. So cool. Such an honor to chat with you, you know, before and, you know, now during our interview, I really, really appreciate it. 